Hello. My name is Louisa Gosling and I work for WaterAid in the International Programs Department. I'm going to give a short presentation to help frame the question of how we can all try to leave no one behind. This isn't the only way of framing leave no one behind, but it does help to focus on solutions. First, I'm going to start with this quote. You can see that it's from the Human Development Report from 2006, but it's still true. Lack of access to wash is not only a technical concern. Fundamentally, lack of access is a result of poverty, inequality and unequal power relationships. Because of the huge inequalities in our world, as the Sustainable Development Goals were launched in 2015, the heads of state pledged that no one will be left behind. In fact, their declaration states, recognising that the dignity of the human person is fundamental, we wish to see the goals and targets met for all nations and peoples and for all segments of society, and we will endeavour to reach the furthest behind first. So this is a clear commitment to really focus on those who are, who are being left behind. In fact, one of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 10, is specifically to reduce inequalities between and within countries. And this is the focus of the High Level Political Forum for 2019. And the focus is on empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality. As well as the Sustainable Development Goals, the fact that the water and sanitation were recognised as human rights in 2010 also firmly makes the case for leaving no one behind and provides a legal framework for doing so. Human rights are universal and apply to all humans. Equality and non-discrimination are core principles of human rights and so are participation and accountability. In other words, states have accepted that they have an obligation to, to ensure the realisation of human rights to water and sanitation for everyone without discrimination. And this means that people have a right also to participate in the decisions that affect them. So when we talk about inclusion in water and sanitation services, it means that people must have access to services and they should be empowered to take part in decision making. So what are the dimensions of inequality? It's quite, it's very complex to understand um, inequalities and they exist at global level within countries, within communities and within households. So how do we start to understand these dimensions of inequality? Um, and now I'm going to try and find my pointer. There it is. So this diagram is to help us to have the, to, to understand the inequalities that we're trying to deal with in this effort to leave no one behind. First of all, spatial factors are very important in relation to water supply. For example, if you live in an area that is very remote, that's affected by water scarcity or by pollution or flooding, or perhaps you're living in an informal urban settlement without land rights or access to services. In this case, you're likely to be at a disadvantage in relation to water. The second circle shows inequalities that are related to the population group you belong to. Now, this could be due to your religion, your ethnicity, your language, your politics, or perhaps even your occupation, or it could be because you're a migrant or a refugee. The particular advantage or disadvantage that, that is um, related to the group you belong to will be different, of course, depending on the wider context, whether that group is the minority or the majority, and what is the relationship of that group with those who are most in power. Now, the third circle here is about the individual factors that affect your relationships with power and your ability to, to for, have decisions and control over resources. So these individual factors are gender, your age, whether you're old or young, your disability and health status. So these factors can cause more or less disadvantage depending on the social norms and beliefs in the society that you live in. 
So you can see that also around these circles we have power, poverty, and also the life cycle, because we all travel through different stages of life cycle. And all of these have an influence on all of the other factors. So here we come to this idea of intersectionality. Intersectionality is a very important concept. And you can see it in this place where all the circles intersect, which shows that different aspects of your identity overlap. And that can either increase or decrease the disadvantage that you experience. For example, if you're an older woman with difficulty walking, but you live in a rich household in a modern city with good services, you'll have a very different experience to if you lived in a very poor remote rural area where you had to, had to walk a long way for drinking water. So to this question, who is marginalized? In summary, when we're thinking about who might be marginalized, who's in danger of being left behind? It's not a simple question. We need to consider the macro level contextual matters. <clears throat> so this includes geography, issues of urban, rural, remote, or living in a slum area. It could be to do with your ethnicity, language, religion, caste, tribe, political party, migration or refugee status, and your economic situation, land ownership. And then you also have to consider the micro um, factors of gender, age, disability, and health status. So this looks like a complicated diagram. And what this shows is it, it just reinforces to identify who's marginalized, consider these macro level contextual factors that we've just talked about. You also need to consider <coughs> the micro level, which are sort of universal factors, they apply everywhere. And you need to consider the intersection between the macro and the micro level characteristics, all of which can combine to, to show or increase your potential for marginalization. So having identified who's marginalized, <clears throat> then need to think about, so what are the barriers to inclusion that affect that, the, pe the people that you're thinking about in your context? So the barriers can be physical or environmental barriers. These can be in the natural environment. So for example, the steep and muddy slopes that people commonly have to tackle to collect water in some places. There are also barriers in the designed or the built environment, like the way that the water pumps are designed and the platforms that are very difficult to reach for people with difficulty walking <clears throat> or pumps that are hard to operate for people with weaker arms. The barriers may also be in the methods and modes of, of communication used that could be inaccessible for people who have a different language or for people who find it difficult to read, hard to hear, hard to see, or hard to understand. There are also institutional barriers here which are very significant. For example, the cultural norms and, tra and traditional practices that can affect um, how easy it is for marginalized people to make their views heard or that might make their exclusion more extreme. For example, gender norms in many societies make it difficult for women to have their views heard in some circumstances. There's also often a lack of legislation and policies that could prevent discrimination and a lack of monitoring information to show who's left behind. And decision-making processes can be very difficult for people to engage with if they have less power. Finally, we have attitudinal barriers, and these affect both the beliefs, the practices, the behavior, and the way that people are treated. For example, in many cultures, there's a lot of stigma about disability and neg neg negative attitudes that mean people with disabilities can feel excluded, even when there's no physical barriers. The attitudinal barriers can also be upheld by the people who are marginalized themselves, for example, by feelings of powerlessness or dependency, which make it difficult for them to be assertive or to make their views heard. All of these barriers need to be addressed in order to make WASH services inclusive so that the services are universally designed, they're participatory, and that this is underpinned by legal uh, compliance, but also empowerment and accountability. Now, this is just a quick slide to think about participation. This diagram shows the different steps of a participation ladder. 
At the lower steps, our participation can be tokenistic. We might be at the meeting, but not able to influence anything. At the higher level, we can start to influence and even control what happens. This understanding of different stages and levels of participation is very important concept when we're talking about leaving no one behind. So now, how can we implement this framework to leave no one behind? This is, the, this is what we would suggest. One area is working with government and service providers to help reduce the barriers to water supply, help them to understand their responsibility to reach everyone and to be accountable. At the same time, we need to work with the people who are marginalised to help them understand access to water as their right, not a privilege, and support them to demand this so they know how to engage with the duty bearers, with the government and the service providers. And together, working on with both of these, develop technical solutions to find the solutions to reaching difficult places, making sure services are accessible, sustainable and affordable. We need to find the institutional solutions, helping to strengthen the systems, strengthen capacity, ensure the information is available, there are standards, laws, appropriate tariffs, platforms to engage, and accountability mechanisms. And finally, thinking about the solutions to the attitudinal barriers, recognising that safe drinking water is a human right for everyone, not just a gift from God or a privilege. And we're seeking to reduce stigma and discrimination and to bring the voice of marginalised people to the centre of decision making. Now, we hope that this presentation has been useful for you. The other presentations in this webinar and in the rest of this RWSN series will show how different members are working to tackle these barriers in different ways. We look forward to learning very much. We look, we look forward to learning from each other about how to leave no one behind. Thank you very much for joining the webinar and I look forward to your contributions slide has a few resources which will be available for those who would like to find out more. Thank you very much.